We're talking about kids here today. As we get into the sermon series, Home Improvement, and, and, and uh, at the beginning of the series, we're talking about parenting and, and the gift that children are, amen? And God has given us these kiddos to steward, and, 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 and the truth of God is we're being rooted in truth. God's truth speaks to every area of our lives, whether it's finances and romance, sex, hospitality, parenting. He speaks and gives wisdom and hope for our homes. Last couple of weeks, as we've been walking through things, we see that, that, that as we engage in, in, in this, this, this vital, this significant space of, of, of parenting, this great calling and burden, that, that, that the priority for us as parents is not to control our children, but to be under control of the Holy Spirit. It's a huge mental shift and a power shift. We're not to seek to control our kids, but to be under control of the Holy Spirit. And that the best thing that we can do for our kids is have an authentic devotion to Jesus Christ ourselves. Because the purpose for us in parenting isn't just raising kids, isn't just keeping them from problems and and hoping the best model citizens, but to raise kids to become spiritual parents, to raise kids to be like Jesus, whole and holy. I'm going to share some of my own parenting experiences and experiences with my own parents through this journey, and Ian is already smirking. He's like, oh, no. Pray for my sons. Don't worry, not today. (laughs) So when I was was a teenager, um, I got involved with wrong friends and uh, uh, headed down a life, uh, a trajectory of, of self-destruction, just seeking to find my identity in the people that I'm around because you know the power and the presence and the influence of the people that you put yourself around and, and, and medicating some of my own anxiety that I didn't really fully understand and my own pain in my life, uh, trying to seek some of that through uh, affirmation and, and from these other, other peers in my life. Um, was taken advantage of sexually by one of my peers, um, was exposed to pornography early on, and, uh, uh, and that became, that and self-stimulation became a motive of self-coping with life, pornography, stealing, making that an art, smoking, whatever I could, vandalism, all these different things of just trying to find worth, hope, living in the moment. YOLO, you know, you only live once, right? And you could say it kind of falls back on that phrase, looking for love in all all the wrong places. But I was headed on a trajectory of just self-destruction in my early teens. And some of that, and my parents, they're just trying to get by. They're, they're, They're working two jobs trying to just make ends meet and struggling to because the ends didn't always meet together uh, with putting food on the table. And, and, uh, and so, you know, working multiple jobs there and supervision was lower. And when supervision is low in parenting, when the cat's away, what will the mice do? Mice will play. And uh, it, was, it was when it came out in my grades at school. And I thought... You know, I was going to be sneaky and, and, you know, I was going to copy off of other people, you know, let them do the hard work for me and, and uh, get the grades, right? And oftentimes the people who let you copy, you should be suspect of why they're letting you copy. And uh, my, my grades weren't, weren't thriving, surprisingly. Uh, and it was in parent-teacher conferences. My parents... Uh, uh, showed up and were part of that, and it was, uh, it was, this was a turning point, a transformational point in my life. And it's a good thing my parents stepped into that space. They, they, they tried their best. They gave their best with what they had at that time and, and providing that supervision, and, and they heard the, the word from my, my teachers, ah, your son's getting an F in a variety of cl- classes. Now, my dad's a college professor. Academics are very important. I heard from my home, barbers get A's. Barbers get A's. Standards high. That was an identity statement. And uh, needless to say, 
Things were not well when they got home that night. <laughs> what my parents did, my dad has overcome so much in his life, and he was one who would be, who would be given to anger because of the stress and the pain and the, and the things that have happened in his life that, that he was trying to work through, and, 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 and he, he did not act out of anger. What they did was they grounded me until, especially in math, because it was algebra class, they grounded me, and this was November, until I did every assignment from the beginning of the school year over up to present. They took my life away from me, if you will. <laughs> Turns out that next semester, I was the top student in the class. Turns out, four years later, five years later, I would be pursuing a math degree and have a comprehensive degree in mathematics, physics, and computer science. If you need help with algebra and calculus, this guy. Not only did it just change and things in terms of academics, but that was a pivot point in terms of my heart because I was headed on a road of self-destruction. Discipline. Discipline is not a negative thing. It's not something to be avoided. Discipline is not destructive. When you hear the word discipline, there's probably a lot of emotions that come up. There's a lot of images that come up for us of what that means and how it was done. And today we're going to break down some of these myths that we have that get in the way of us of experiencing God's design, the goodness of discipline. Discipline is loving, it's necessary, and it's good. Rules without relationship lead to rebellion. That was a phrase growing up. I believe James Dobson came up with that. But relationship without rules will lead to disrespect and reckless behavior. God's designed parenting to have, to need structure and secure relationship. Healthy parenting has structure and secure relationship. And th these principles that we're walking through are true if you're a teacher, if you work with kids in any capacity. Rules and relationship cultivate responsibility and respect. I'm going to be in Ephesians 4 and Hebrews 12 here this morning. If you want to turn there and go back and forth between the two. If you have a Bible or Bible app, we have Bibles underneath the chairs in front of you. This is a two-part sermon here of the goodness of God in discipline. I'm going to be starting in Ephesians 6, verse 4, and then I'll read from Hebrews chapter 12. Fathers, this is, include mothers as well, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. In Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and punishes every son he receives. Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons and daughters. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us, and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what they seemed, seemed good to them, and he does it for our benefit so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time. All the people said, amen. <laughs> but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Let's pray. 
Holy Spirit, we just ask for your leading and work and intervention right now, Lord. And just this, this, this valuable space, this important, critical space, Lord, in this modern time that we misunderstand based on, based on abuses and, and poor experiences. But God, the, the beauty, the significance, the goodness, Lord, of bringing structure to our homes and to relationships with our kiddos of discipline. And Lord God, we're going to be tempted in, in a way to, 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 to focus on, on ourselves. How do, we, how do we pull ourselves up here? How do we accomplish this on our own? But Lord Jesus, it, it's through your power, it, it's through dependence on you that we are able to parent, that we are able to lead children, that we are able to discipline your way in such a way that it's out of love and it's transformational in the kiddos' lives that you've entrusted us. Spirit, work in us this morning. Work in me, your servant. In your name I pray. Amen. Going back to and starting with Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Fathers and mothers, in, in this time, and just to make a quick comment here, when it's referring to fathers, or you see on the screen, it's reference to sons. This was a cultural uh, 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 a way of including all. It wasn't in, in referencing the masculine only, didn't mean to only apply to boys or men, but it was inclusive culturally of all. Just like in, for example, the, the Spanish language, when you, when you refer to all of a group, it's in the masculine uh, and it inc is inclusive of all people, for example. So just to clarify that there. So fathers and mothers, do not provoke your children ang to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the, of the Lord. This word discipline, interestingly enough, is only used one other place, and that's in that passage in Hebrews that, uh, uh, that we just read through here and now. This word discipline it has uh, an elasticity to it. It means a variety of different things here, and it, but it's part, it's kind of a package as we think of this, all right? Discipline means training, and you'll hear this used in the Old Testament. We're going to re look back to some of the Proverbs and the wisdom of God in parenting from the Proverbs. But discipline implies training, teaching, and correction. Those three things are all part of this concept of discipline. Training, teaching, correction. As we just read here, Raising our children up in the discipline, in the training, in the teaching, in the correction of the Lord. This is guided by God. It's not just something that we come up with, but it's to be guided by the Lord himself, by Jesus Christ, by the word of God. We need the Lord's direction and help. Kids didn't come with a manual, but God gave us a manual of wisdom. And as we've talked about this, we got to be clear, he gives us the power. Because as we go through some of these principles and things, you're going to be tempted to be, uh, 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 receive things out of shame of what you're doing wrong or, or, or a list of things that you've got to do and get right and you just feel powerless, you feel discouraged. That's not what this is about. The Lord wants to work his life, his power through you. Raise your children up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. As we see in Hebrews 12, in Hebrews 12, the, the author there is trying to help us understand God's work and using life circumstances to train us, to produce, what does he want to do? To produce holiness. He wants to produce his own character in, his, in our hearts and our lives. As we've talked about, what does this look like? To love God and to love others. The purpose of discipline isn't always this, this cause and effect because you did something wrong, here I am, I'm going to punish you. That's one of the myths that we have related to discipline. Discipline from God using circumstances and relationships in our life aren't because you did something wrong and he caught you, but because God knows our hearts. And our hearts, we're broken and we're in need of healing. That's a humble place for us to all receive, Lord, I need to grow. Anybody here don't, don't need to grow? Anybody here arrived? Anybody? Be careful, you raise your hand. <laughs> we all 
We all are broken. We all are in need of growth. We all are limited. So discipline isn't a reaction to something we've done wrong. It's out of love to produce the character of God in our hearts and our lives. Another way to put it is discipline is God's means of setting us free. Setting us free from things that that, that enslave us, things in which we think are good, but I thought pornography was good. I, I, I thought taking things when I wanted it, I thought that was good. It worked for me. I thought doing whatever I want, whether it involved destroying other people's property, I thought that was good. No. These things living for myself was actually destroying me. And the Lord in his goodness, his discipline is to set us free. Check out this verse here from Proverbs 13. He who spares the rod hates his son, but the one who loves him is careful to discipline him. Let this sink in, friends. The rod was this metaphor for for discipline, not abuse. He who spares the rod, who spares their child from discipline, hates his son or daughter. But he who loves him is careful to discipline him. Discipline is good. It should co- it's intended to come from a place of care and of love, of desiring and seeking what's best for our kids. Because as this next proverb uh, uh, reminds us, as I just shared, what's in our heart, folly, foolishness, is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. There's a deeper need, there's a deeper struggle in the soul of every person and every child. And the use of discipline sets us free. And the, and the application of discipline that's important for us to understand is it's there that we encounter and we teach our kids to encounter the gospel, Jesus. If we do not correct our kiddos, if we do not teach to them, if we do not provide them structure and supervision, and then reinforce that with affirmation or consequences, if, we do, if our kids are not, if we do not allow them to experience consequences for their choices, they will not learn that they are broken. They will not learn that they have a need to grow. They have a need for Jesus. It's not a behavior issue that they got wrong once. It's a heart issue that we're looking to shape in our kiddos. And that heart issue is only something that Jesus can can fix in our lives. And and that space of discipline and our correcting with our kids creates the opportunity for us to lead them to Jesus. Lord, I need you to help shape my heart, to help me want to, to, to respect authority, to follow mom and dad, to obey mom and dad to use self-control, to not hit my sister when she takes my toy or when she has the toy that I want or just because I want to hit my sister. (laughs) Or my brother. The discipline creates, as God shows us, the opportunity to encounter the love of God, the goodness of God. Discipline is loving, necessary, necessary, not optional, necessary, and good. Our children will not learn to accept their boundaries, the boundaries of others, how to deny themselves in order to love God and love others unless we train them through love. So a couple of myths here that we have, uh, that we experience in life here about <laughs> discipline. Many of you, have you have, and many of you probably seen the show Mythbusters. Great show, right? Love that show. Such a, such a great uh, educational show as well. And, 
And so we're going to bust some myths here this morning that we have about discipline. So uh, this first one here, this myth, is that discipline applies to disobedience. Discipline is the last resort. But the truth is, discipline begins far before disobedience. Disobedi- discipline is the beginning of parenting. As I mentioned, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word discipline means training. When you think of training, uh, if any of you had physical trainers in your life, uh, uh, you've, you've gone to the gym and, and, and you needed a little extra help. To, uh, Jake Walker will help you. Uh, he will straighten you out in life. He's, he's a good man. He will he'll get after, help you get after it. He might get after you too. Just, just okay. Just Anyway, sorry, Jake. Sorry about that. <laughs> Training isn't something that's one and done. You go to the gym and you're swole, right? You're huge and you're ripped and, and you got that six pack, you know, instead of the case, you know, uh, uh, right? You, you know, training, it's repetition. It's over and over and you need accountability and, and, and the, the, the training is such a good word when we understand like, this is what parenting is. It's training. It's training with our kiddos. We're training them to be parents, to be spiritual parents, to be like Jesus. It doesn't ever end. It changes as they progress over time. So discipline is more than merely reinforcing what we've taught or, di- or, 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 or correcting disobedience. Be- discipline is the beginning of parenting, of where we begin to teach that this is how you are to live. This is how you're to follow instructions. This is how you're to be respectful. This is how you're to handle your phone. This is how... You're to have a good friendship. This is how you're to respect women. How you're to be in a relationship with a guy. How do you honor your own body's needs for health? And how do you honor God's design for sex? We need teaching, training. As Proverbs 22, 6 says, we saw this last week, train a child in the way he or she should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. The Chinese emperor Mao Zedong had the statement, give me a child for the first five years and I'll have them for the rest of their life. Give me a child for the first five years and I'll have them for the rest of their life. He understood the power of imprinting, the, 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 the sponge and, and the emotional impact of formation early on in a children's life. He knew that what we do early on will affect and lay the foundations for emotional rules that cause us to automatically act, think, filter, and relate in life. Parenting is powerful. Regardless of what you do, this statement isn't necessarily as mu- a promise as much as it is an axiom of truth. However you train your children for good or ill. However, we imprint them with our relationship and the rules. It's going to set a course and a trajectory that will lead them. Christ can redeem though and change that, but it, it, it requires healing and a great deal of work. Parenting is powerful. And so we want to be intentional because it's this training in all aspects of life. Last week, I, I, I threw up this list of proactive parenting principles. Proactive parenting principles involves teaching, practicing with our kids, modeling, supervision, reminding, or pre teaching, celebrating our kids when they're on the path, disciplining with grace when they're off the path, and repetition. This involves having a plan. Parenting begins not, discipline does not begin in disobedience, but as parents having a plan. What are the expectations that we have? Couples, even single parents here, sitting down and processing, writing out, what are my expectations for home? What are our values What are we wanting to teach? And things grow and develop over time, right? 
They start with little things of how to respect others, how to follow instructions and obey, how to accept decisions and accept no. That's a big one, accepting no. Some of us are still teaching our spouses that, right? (laughs) But those things grow and become more complicated of how do we, we're teaching to our kids, if they are to have a phone, how do we use that phone? What are the boundaries around the, 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 the cell phone? How do they handle work, their schoolwork, romantic relationships, healthy sexuality, taking care of their bodies, friendships? These become more complicated. We need to be intentional about teaching and training our children in these spaces. But that takes time for us to process what are we teaching? What, what, is the, what are the values? What do we want to communicate with them? We need to be clear about this. Parents, you need to have time and a place where you can talk together. Sometimes we don't realize what we need to teach until we see the behavior played out in our kids. And that's okay, but we want to respond and be intentional rather than react to our kids in the moment. This teaching then also involves putting together a plan of what are our consequences, what are the consequences that we have? Sometimes and oftentimes in parenting that's reactive, the, the, we're in a parenting moment with a child. And again, we, we may not have already taught to our kids about this, this situation of their, maybe let's use their behavior in, in, in a public space or, or at Hy-Vee or at Walmart. And, and, and things escalate in our reaction. We're upset. We get angry with them. Why are you doing this again? How many times do I have to tell you? And in that moment, we come up with a consequence. Like, you're not going to have TV forever. (laughs) No candy ever for you anymore. And we go to these extremes as parents because we're reacting in the moment. We've lost control, and we're trying to find that control, and we're not prepared. We haven't thought about these consequences, and then then we pre-teach, we let the kids know, hey, these are the consequences that are going to be in place. You're going to lose five minutes of TV time. You're not going to be locked in your room forever. You're going to lose that sweet snack. That's a privilege. You're going to lose some of the game time. We've already prepared. We've already talked about that. And I'm not overreacting and we're not bringing in make th- empty threats. Any parent made any, any empty threats? <laughs> yeah, every parent in the house should ra- raise their hand at some level. We've made empty threats because we're not prepared. It doesn't have to be that way. God's design for parenting and training is proactive and it takes time for us to sit down, process, talk together, have a plan. In marriage, it's so important that we're on the same page, too, in communicating these plans and enforcing our expectations and the values and the consequences. This takes time, right? But friends, it takes time when we're trying to clean up the mess when we were unintentional with our kids. You can either take the time up front or you'll take that time. The kids will make sure of it. <laughs> Teaching our children, when we have that mindset, discipline is to train, is to teach. I want to be prepared. We want to have that place. We want to have the expectations, the consequences discussed and prepared. In addition to this, requires where are we going to talk about this with our kiddos? Where are the family contexts that you are meeting together? This is the significance of family meals. Those are natural spaces where we can talk and train our children and talk about our values and our life together and honoring the Lord and training their hearts. Family devotions, that's another great space. Family meetings, they may may happen once a month or once a week. We have a dedicated time. Hey, we're going to get together. We're going to talk about the schedule. We're going to talk about what's happening these are intentional spaces. Where, where, where do we have these spaces, these intentional spaces that are not reactive? They're not in the heat of the moment of our kids' disobedience where we're trying to hash things out. Best parenting, good parenting, parenting that prevents our kids 
hearts from, 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 from going in the direction of self-destruction is, happens in advance, happens outside of the moments of disobedience and correction. Teaching, modeling, parenting is more caught than taught. Parenting is more caught than taught. Do you understand what that's saying there? Like, we have to watch. We have to be aware of what are we saying, how are we acting. Now, we're not perfect people as parents. We need to be ready and having received the grace of God, be willing to use our own failures, our own struggles, our own poor interactions to even teach to our kids. You know what? When I talk to you, when, I re- when we were at the store there, I reacted out of anger. What have we talked about acting out of anger? You know, we want to take a breath. We, we want to be self-controlled. We want to use our words, not our emotions. Did I do that? No, you're right. I used my emotion. I was wrong. I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? We're modeling even in our brokenness. You know, Mommy and I were having an intense conversation. What did you feel? What did you hear? when we were talking, when we were having a discussion. (laughs) What do you, how do you think we handled that? What would you have done differently? What should we do differently? Apologizing in front of our kids, sweetheart, I I, I was disrespectful in how I treated you. Will you forgive me? Modeling. And using that and being intentional about that with our kiddos. That's powerful. Much of parenting is caught, not taught. It's felt. And we know that because we hear the things that come up out, our, out of our kids' mouths and we're like, oh Lord, they were listening. <laughs> Whoops. Sponges. Proactive parenting requires supervision. This is one that we we would love to believe that our kids are just naturally going to take care of themselves and be good. And this gets into the area of phones. And we're going a little bit longer here today, friends. Bear with me. This is just super important. we got to talk about phones. This is a frontier that no generation has really ever faced. And, And we are beginning to deal with the issues of parenting with devices and unlimited access to the Internet. According to one source in statistics, 93% of boys under the age of 18 will have looked at pornography and predominantly through a smartphone technology. 70, no, 62% of ladies. Think of those numbers. How dramatic that is. What has the smartphone technology, every kid having a device, an unlimited access to this world where these were things that had to be secretly purchased, were not available to the widespread world everywhere. And we're we're putting our kids at risk with unsupervised access, not only to all this dangerous information. It's like putting our kids in a candy store and and thinking they're going to eat vegetables. Our kids need supervision. Smartphones, the use of phones are such a significant thing. I'm an advocate. Delay that as long as you can. As long as you can as parents. Until it's absolutely necessary. There's no shame. I don't want to communicate that. If your kids have phones, you need a monitor. You are putting your children at risk and at harm. Not only to things that they choose, but to predators as well. They don't have filters. Kids are being exposed in our elementary school. Kids are showing YouTube videos and and pornographic information. And you know, I know about it because they talk about it on Kingdom Kids on Wednesday nights of what they've heard and what they saw. This is happening. Kids need supervision. 
There's software, things like Covenant Eyes, Bark, that help us provide supervision for our kiddos. There's, there, there are ways to do family sharing where you can regulate what is used on the phones. Our kids need supervision. That's not just smartphone technology, but that is such a big area, friends. And it's eroding and it's destroying our kids in a silent way. And it's not, a bad, it's not bad to be restricted. It's healthy to understand the dangers and their limits. We need monitoring with our kiddos and their friendships. Checking in on them. It's okay. Hey, have doors open when you play, when your friends are over. Particularly opposite sex relation, relationships and friendships. Doors open. Hey, your phone, it's going to be upstairs. It stays upstairs. At night, it's on the counter. <clears throat> Checking in at school with, par- with teachers. <coughs> Checking in with other parents. Hey, how did things go? Not because you're expecting your child to be some evil sinner, because it's healthy. We've gotten into a place where, where we fear accountability. Accountability isn't distrust. It's a right kind of trust. It's a healthy kind of trust that we can hold each other accountable. And it begins with our kids knowing and establishing it's good to be accountable, right? Even as a male, as an adult, I still need accountability. It's healthy. It's good. We teach our kids this early on. They need to be monitored. They need to be checked in on. That it actually brings in, it's proven that this kind of structure, supervision, brings a sense of security into the heart and soul of a child. We talked a little bit about the need for reminders and pre-teaching. We've already talked about scenarios where, where, where things are, behaviors are, are, are likely to be significant. We'll talk next week about some live situations. How do we navigate some of these conversations of difficult parenting moments with our kiddos? We must reinforce. We talked about the importance last week. Are we looking for ways that our kids fall on the path when they show love and respect to others, when they've been self-controlled? Are we praising our kids or are we just cor- correcting them and telling them no and stop and don't? For the sake of our time here, I'm just going to bring things down. We'll get to, to the rest of these myths here next week. Parenting is much like a butterfly. And it's in its process of metamorphosis coming out of a cocoon. Some of you may know about the, the metaphor of the butterfly, but, but in order for when it be, transforms from a caterpillar in order to a butterfly, it's got to come out of this chrysalis, this, 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 this uh, hard exterior that's formed in order to protect it while the butterfly was transforming. In order for that butterfly to come out and to be free, it has to beat itself and its wings against the walls of this cocoon. And it's this laborious process of, of, of beating itself against the walls of the cocoon, and as it, as it does, the cocoon opens gradually. And then the butterfly comes out and is able to fall away. You know what happens if that cocoon opens up prematurely and that butterfly doesn't beat itself against the walls of the cocoon? It falls right to the ground. And its wings, it cannot fly. It will not survive. You see, in parenting, we are the cocoon. Our kids beat themselves against us, and we feel that at times, right? We get that attitude. We receive those. We work through those tantrums with them. We, we get that lip. We get the defiance. We get the, the phrases, I hate you. You don't love me. We have those sleepless nights wondering what's going to happen. We are that, that, that safe and secure place, the structure for our kiddos, in order for them to be strong enough in soul, in order to 
be free and love God and love others and have the strength to say no to themselves and no to the world because of the beating that we took in loving them with discipline. Discipline is good. It's necessary. It's loving. Our kids will not survive in this world without it. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we need you again as we've talked about these principles of parenting, God. From your way to, to, to raise up, to train our children in the way they should go, to train them up in your instructions, Lord. Jesus, we talked about the, the importance of being proactive and, and creating these spaces to being intentional, be planning. But God, we feel that we're always just trying to catch up. We're just lo looking for a quick fix for our kiddos and, and what will shape their hearts and, and what will help my, my defiant son and, or, 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 or my, my spiteful daughter. change, Lord God. Father, I thank you. Grant us your patience, your heart, that parenting is a process. It's training over time. And in that, Lord Jesus, we realize you are training us. And we want to receive that even now, Lord God, as we consider the, the, the role and, and function and the, 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 the burden of parenting, Lord God, is this just as much about us being trained by you as it is you tra us training our kiddos. Help us, Lord God, in grace to receive that. You're training us to depend on you. You're training us, Lord God, to, to let your power work through us. You're training us to be weak so that you can be strong, to be patient, to trust you. And so, God, we come in need of receiving you for this task. In your name we pray, amen.